Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining Rust Day on Google Open Source Live. If you haven't attended Open Source Live before, it's a monthly web series where each month we explore a different topic within open source. Today, of course, is all about Rust. My name is Manish Gorgaukar, and I'm the lead of the Rust Project's DevTools team. I really like Rust because I think systems programming is cool and Rust makes it much more accessible. Thank you, Manish. Good day, everyone. My name is Lars Bergstrom, Director of Engineering for Android's Platform Programming Languages team and Google's Corporate Director to the Rust Foundation. Manish, can you please tell the folks what's in store for today? We have some really interesting topics in store today. To start with, Jeffrey Vanderstep and my co-host Lars will be leading a session focused on how and when to start adopting Rust into your project using lessons learned from Android's journey. So don't forget to put your questions in the live Q&A forum below the live stream window. Speakers are ready to answer your questions live and we'll get to as many as they possibly can within the time allotted. Just a note, if you're viewing in full screen, you'll need to exit full screen to see the live Q&A forum. All our sessions have been pre-recorded to allow for accurate transcripts and so that the speakers can focus on answering questions live. Now, once we're done, don't forget to join us at the after party. You'll see a button to join in the event page at the end of the last session. And last but not least, use the hashtag Google OS Live to share your experience on social media. Now, we'll get started. Hi, I'm Lars Bergstrom, Director of Engineering for the Android Platform Programming Languages team. Together with my colleague, Jeff, we're going to talk about both why and how to adopt Rust using our own adoption here at Google on Android to illustrate a bunch of the points. So if you're here, you've probably already heard about Rust, a new programming language designed around three big pillars. First, it provides full performance and control you need to write systems programs that are in direct control of the hardware resources. Second, it provides safety from a variety of errors around the misuse of memory or concurrent thread execution. And finally, it has a modern take on providing mature documentation and tooling around all aspects of the language and its ecosystem. So most people come to Rust because of the unique combination of those first two pillars, performance and control with reliability and safety. In most languages, you have to choose one or the other. Languages like JavaScript, Kotlin, and Java have compile time or runtime prevention of threading or memory corruption issues, but they abstract away your access to the machine. On the other side, the C family of languages provides that access, but with little in the way of safeguards. So increasingly, our projects really need both of those. Speaking for Android, our devices rely on taking advantage of parallelism while dealing with many complex concurrent events. Mobile phones continue to increase the amount of parallelism through more CPU cores. And scaling via that parallelism instead of jacking up the frequency of the CPU is a key way for our users to have a great flicker-free experience without hurting their battery life. But at the same time, we have myriad devices, phones and tablets, headphones and TVs, all of which are communicating concurrently with each other and introducing a lot of complexity that makes it really hard to build stable systems. Rust is the only language we know that gives us both the performance and the safety that we need. But of course, it's not just about the language itself. The code we write is often a small portion of the overall deliverable. In a system like Android, over three quarters of the source code, 75 million of the 100 million lines of code, are third-party ecosystem libraries that we rely on. And Rust makes it easy to integrate and update those dependencies. And that's something we haven't really had with C or Java. There's also a really consistent story around the code style and warnings. Rust format provides code style defaults that you'll see across the entire ecosystem. And Clippy enforces appropriate use of coding patterns. That means in every Rust project you run into, you'll be able to understand the code. There aren't the sort of local dialects that you get with C++ where every company and every project has chosen some different subset or stylistic way of using the language. Beyond the tooling though, the Rust project was one of the first language communities to adopt and enforce not only a code of conduct, but norms around being welcoming to developers, no matter what their prior background is or what industry they're working in. This means that for new adopters of the language, it's easy to get early feedback and guidance on your journey. But just being an amazing language with great tooling and a fantastic community 
isn't really sufficient for most businesses to make the big investment of supporting a new language. Beyond the cost of adding the tools to the system, there's training, there's hiring, there's interrupt with all of your existing code, just to name a few. So what's the business case? At least for Android, the case is pretty easy. Security. As an operating system delivering code to over 3 billion devices, the cost to our users, partners, and Google itself is really high for each and every security issue. And of those security issues, the vast majority of them are memory safety bugs. Now, we've invested heavily in hardware features, improved our compilers, built static analyzers, and dynamic sanitization tools to try and address this issue. But the exploits continue to be found faster than we can keep up with them via tooling. So for us, and especially in new code that we're writing, Rust is absolutely the smartest choice. It protects us from the entire class of memory safety bugs right from the start, and it's already paid back our investment in it on Android. Of course, it doesn't hurt that the teams who have adopted Rust really enjoy working with it. Here's a quote from the technical lead of the Bluetooth team. There was a marked shift implementing things in Rust. After you compile, you know it's not going to blow up in unexpected ways, so you can focus on the complexities of Bluetooth rather than the code exploding. Bluetooth is really complicated. There are many specifications, not all of which are perfectly implemented by the devices. And even if they were, devices can come and go at unpredictable times, leading to some really deep complexity that you have to capture in the code. Let's take a look at some of that code to see an example of that. So the details here aren't really important. The code on the left is the existing C++ code for, for the previous version of the Bluetooth stack. It's highly asynchronous with handling many hardware events, timeouts, and software commands. It it's a big pile of functions littered with asserts, state machines embedded in opcodes, and a bunch of unit tests you can't see off to the side. Understanding all of the interactions and the various machinery involves reasoning about that entire system in order to make any change. On the other side, though, the Rust code can use the built-in asynchronous functions and embed the whole state machine including all the timeout conditions in a single dispatch loop. This not only makes writing the code easier, but also modifying it later to make sure that you didn't introduce some new error state or mishandling a command where you handled it in one place, but you missed it in another. The compiler will automatically catch all those cases for you. So most importantly, it means that you don't have to be an expert in the entire system to either make a change or to review one. Another early adopter of Rust in Android was the security team. So to quote one of their technical leads, after writing Rust code for a year, the kind of flawed code that C++ compilers would tolerate due to C++'s specified tolerance for undefined behavior appears ridiculous. So we see this over and over. Not only does Rust make it possible for people without a systems programming background to write great code, but even people with decades of experience writing and shipping production C and C++ see the benefits of Rust. Writing performant and safe code in existing languages is just too hard. So we've looked a bit at the why of adoption. Now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Jeff, to talk about the how of adoption. Take it away, Jeff. Thanks, Lars. Uh, I'm Jeff Vanderstoop from the Android security team. And as Lars mentioned, security was a big motivator for adopting Rust in Android. But of course, security is only one of the many stakeholders in the room. There were a number of important problems that needed to be solved and risks that needed to be addressed before we could move forward. The first question that we needed to answer was, does this actually solve a problem? If you've been around the industry for a while, you've likely developed some pessimism that the next tool, training, or mit mitigation is going to fix our problems with memory safety or even substantially raise the bar. But why is that? Iterating and incrementally solving problems is a tried and true engineering technique. And for the past 30 years now, and particularly the last 10 years, we as an industry have been working hard on making C and C++ safer. Part of the problem, I think, is that we've been chasing the wrong metrics for success. There's been a lot of focus on the number of vulnerabilities found or prevented, but really that needs to be considered within the context of the entire problem. Like my picture here of, of uh, Piglet shows um, ineffective problem solving, we can't just focus on removing bugs. We need to step back and say, are our efforts actually resulting in vulnerabilities becoming rare? 
Of course, we have a good way to prevent memory safety vulnerabilities, memory safe languages, but a critical difference between today and 10 years ago is that today we have a memory safe language that can be used in all the same places where we currently use C and C++. But then we have tens of millions of lines of C and C++ code. So does switching to a new language actually help? To answer that question, we did an evaluation of all the memory safety bugs reported to Android in 2021. We see that they're unevenly distributed across our code base with new or recently modified code having much a much higher frequency of, of vulnerabilities. The key takeaway for this is that if we want to prevent memory safety vulnerabilities, switching to a new development, switching new development away from C and C++ to, Ru to Rust will immediately have a large impact, not just on our total number of vulnerabilities, but on the teams that own that code. Teams writing Rust will have a significantly lower overhead devoted to bug and vulnerability remediation. They'll get to spend their time on, on other things like writing new code. Um, and while we did this analysis on Android, I, I would note that similar results have been demonstrated on other large code bases. And it's very relevant, it's likely relevant to your code base. So you don't need to rewrite everything to get the benefits of switching to a memory safe language. Another big area that we needed to investigate was how will Rust integrate into uh, our existing systems? So for Android, we needed to evaluate two areas. The first was how will Rust interop with our other programming languages? And the other was, how will we integrate support with Android's custom build system? So I've included links to blog posts here where, that we've published that include all of the details of how we went evaluating both of these areas. But here I want to specifically talk about language interop because we wasted a lot of time initially on looking at general interop between Rust and C++. So don't do that. Instead, focus on your existing code base and where you'll need interopt. For Android, that was pretty easy to approximate for Rust to C++ by looking at how we reuse C++ throughout our code base. In other words, if we commonly reuse functionality from C++ across different projects, we'll likely need to use that same functionality within our Rust code for the same purposes. With that knowledge, we were able to add interop solutions that fulfilled Android's needs. For us, that was a combination of uh, common tools like BindGen, the C++ CXX crate for creating bindings to C++ code, and we also had some carefully chosen native bindings that, that we made. Uh, for example, um, to generate Android's interface definition language. So a risk that we needed to address was, what if we change our mind? Long-term commitment to a language is costly, and it's genuinely difficult to know until it's in, in use if it was the right decision. One way that we helped to make this decision easier was by setting up our early efforts as a reversible pilot. This provided our leadership with the opportunity to evaluate support before giving approval to move out of the pilot stage, which we have since done. And finally, there's a lot of other stakeholders. So who needs to sign off? We had to do a lot of work to convince folks that Rust was the right decision for Android. And if you're considering Rust for your project, you may need to do the same. Some areas where I think you're good to go are security. Uh, Rust is an obvious choice for system software and an obvious way to avoid the high vulnerability density of C and C++. Another area was performance. And if you're currently using C++, you're likely very concerned about performance. There's a lot of public data available on this. And if you're skeptical like we were, you can do your own investigations on performance. Multiple independent teams within Google have confirmed that Rust performance characteristics are remarkably similar to C++ on an apples to apples comparison. Finally, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, other areas and a lot of additional due diligence was needed to make sure that Rust integrated well with our existing systems. Um, some of this was just verifying, for example, that crashes were picked up by a crash reporting system. 
but other things required improvements uh, that you'll that you will benefit from and that we upstream to the rest project such as build reproducibility so the last large area that i wanted to address was that uh what if no one knows Rust, or what if you only have a small small team that knows Rust? How how do you get started? So for us, uh, we started with a small core team, and that could really be just a couple of people, and use that team to bootstrap other teams and people. So first, we onboarded. Uh, early adopter projects where users were interested in learning and tolerant to integration speed bumps. And by speed bumps, I mean, um, you know, a, a third party library that they needed wasn't available or, or um, a feature that a build feature that they needed wasn't available. And so we would help them. But as I said, they needed to be ha have some tolerance to, to um, delays like that. Um, the other thing that we did was I've called it no free for alls. And what I mean there is that we didn't just allow everyone to start using Rust immediately. We actually scaled very intentionally. We chose projects carefully and we used technical means to enforce those decisions. So for us, that mean, means that we actually had technical enforcement of which projects within the entire Android open source project were actually allowed to, to use Rust. Finally, as you're scaling, the, the, the people and teams that you've onboarded become part of the scaling effort, and they in turn help onboard new teams and people. So finally, where we're at in the process is that we continue to scale up. We've, we're onboarding new teams, uh, new projects are launching within, within Android that are using Rust, and we actually just recently hit a uh, an exciting milestone where we remove those technical means within our within our system for restricting who can use Rust. So now any team working on the Android open source project is allowed to use Rust. And thanks for joining us for adopting Rust on your team. And let us know if you uh, decide to use Rust on your project. Thanks, Jeff and Lars. I really enjoyed the graph showing how Android's integration needs matched up against the existing Rust interop tooling. We've come a really long way. Speaking of interop, next up, we'll hear from Dmitry Grubenko and Marcel Hlopko, who will be diving deeper into how to think about the actual integration of Rust into a large code base. Take it away, Dmitry and Marcel. Hi, everyone. I'm Dmitry. And today, we will be talking with Marcel about how to adopt Rust in large code bases. So you want to use Rust. The usual advice is to rewrite your current project in Rust. Let's see what your current project is like. It is probably deployed in production. It depends on libraries that are not available in Rust. The project has a lot of code, possibly millions of lines. Your team is pretty large, maybe 50 or even 100 people. And the code is written in unsafe languages like C or C++. Is it still a good idea to rewrite it in Rust? In a big project, big changes are done incrementally, one step at a time. If your project is essential for your company's business, you cannot just ask everyone to freeze feature development while you convert a few million lines of code to Rust. You generally should not do a big bang rewrite in Rust unless you have already decided to start from scratch for other reasons. Most likely, a rewrite is not economically and socially viable. So a big project can adopt a new language only through gradual, incremental changes. How could you start adopting Rust in such a project? Let's discuss your strategy. To start, think about where you're going to add Rust code and how it will talk to the rest of the system. It is probably easier to choose a new feature that is not extremely important and that is not central to the project. And it should also not have a hard deadline. Nevertheless, Adding Rust code is only one technical aspect of the strategy. Adding Rust to your code base will have an impact on your development process. You want it to be a positive impact, but there can be unexpected negative consequences too. An issue in the edit compile test merge cycle can drain a lot of productivity from a large team. Some people on the team or your leadership might even attribute these workflow issues to the Rust language itself 
creating a threat of rolling back the Rust experiment and even banning Rust language altogether. Therefore, you should evaluate your current development process and plan how Rust will fit in. First, writing code. What editors does your team use? Do these editors have plugins for Rust code navigation and code completion? You should be ready to help your coworkers install and troubleshoot these plugins. If you ask your team to figure it out on their own, don't be surprised if in two weeks your coworkers are frustrated and sick of it, not even code completion works well in this language. You don't want that. Next, code review. You could just do regular code review, or you could customize the process to the Rust language itself to make the most of your code review. Can you integrate the clip linter in your code review tool as a primer check? Do you want to introduce a special code review process for unsafe Rust code? Does your team have enough people with Rust expertise to mentor engineers who are just starting to learn Rust? Once the code is written, we need build and test tooling. Does your build system support Rust at all? How do Rust unit tests fit into the testing workflow? Can your engineers run Rust and non-Rust tests with just one command? And how about your production deployment canarying and monitoring tools? Do they support Rust binaries? Can they collect monitoring information from Rust code? You should work through all of these questions before adding the first line of Rust code to your shipping product. And finally, introducing a new programming language to a team has a huge social component. What you can do to support uh, your team through these major changes to the development and operational process. For example, you can consider what processes and playbooks you can build to reassure your team that Rust code will not cause extra stress, that Rust will not be the root cause of missed deadlines, and that insufficient Rust expertise on the team will not make outages last longer. I recommend that you prepare a rollback plan. I hope that you will not need it. However, having a rollback plan ready reduces the stress and fear of uncertainty in the team. It also emphasizes that your goal is not to make your team write Rust. Wait, what? The goal is not to switch to Rust? That's right. The goal is to achieve better business outcomes for the company. For example, reduce maintenance costs, improve reliability, or create a better working environment for the team. You should be open to the idea that Rust might not work out for the project, at least with your initial attempt. You could explicitly approach Rust adoption as an experiment. This experiment might or might not succeed. You would remove the need to have universal agreement about Rust at the beginning. At some future point, you will have concrete experience, data, and feedback from the team about your experimental Rust usage. Discussing this data is more productive than debating pros and cons of Rust before starting to use it. You can collect this information, write a report, and hold a retrospective with the team and leadership about whether you want to continue, continue using Rust, and if so, how. Be open to the idea that your initial attempt didn't work well. Take a break and try again. Above all, do what is right for your team. During the Rust adoption experiment, you could limit the process changes to a sub-team, say five to seven people. In our Rust pilots, we found that two experienced Rust engineers have enough bandwidth to coach a five to seven people team. If you do start with a sub-team, make sure that you have both senior and junior people on the team, as well as people with and without Rust experience. You will get much better data this way. And this data will be more convincing than any blog post or YouTube video, because data will be about your team, about your project. Now let's discuss technical aspects in detail. When you start adding Rust code to the project, you will need to decide how it will fit into the architecture of the application. You have an important choice, whether Rust code will live in the binary or if you will add Rust to an existing binary that is written in a different language. This choice will determine how your new Rust code will interact with the rest of the project. In case of a new binary, it will be a cross-process interaction and you will not have to worry about FFI. If you choose to add Rust to an existing binary though, you will need to call Rust from another language or vice versa. Let's talk about the first option in more detail. 
I believe that adding a new Rust binary generally leads to a simpler system. If you choose to go this way, you should find components in your system architecture that already expose a cross-process interface of some sort. For example, it can be a database server, structured data files on disk, or local IPC such as Unix sockets. Finally, your system might already expose an RPC server. Such interfaces are often natural extension points. It is very likely that there is an off-the-shelf Rust crate that allows you to talk to your database server, read and write your favorite file format, or send and receive RPCs through pretty much any protocol. You can start implementing a new binary in Rust that uses these interfaces without disrupting the rest of the system. If you later decide that Rust did not work out for you, you can re-implement this binary in your current programming language. If you can afford it, you can even implement two versions of the same binary, one in Rust and one in your current programming language, and compare them. This approach ties in well with framing Rust adoption as an experiment. Let's look at an example. Say we have an application that uses a database. The database is accessed by a backend server. This backend service exposes an internal gRPC endpoint. An HTTP frontend service receives requests from web clients and uses the gRPC backend endpoint. We also have a separate frontend service for our mobile applications. This frontend speaks a REST protocol and uses the same backend. Note that this application does not use a microservice architecture. Each of these three services implements a lot of functionality. That's fine, we can work with this. Let's say we want to add a new feature. We want to start sending email notifications to our users. Can we do it in Rust? If the internal gRPC endpoint allows us to fetch information about users and their notifications, we could write a new service in Rust and connect it to the existing backend. The other alternative is to write a new service that talks directly to the database. Now, what if your application has a monolithic architecture? Something like this. Since the database is accessible here, we could use it directly from Rust. But there is another option. We can add an internal gRPC endpoint to our monolithic service. After all, it already exposes HTTP and REST services. Adding another RPC interface shouldn't be a big deal. Now the notification service written in Rust can use the backend functionality through the new RPC endpoint. Your application architecture does not have to be based on client-server type RPCs. For example, if you have a loosely coupled architecture organized around a message bus, a Rust service will fit right in. If you have a data processing pipeline that stores intermediate results in files, you can write a new processing stage in Rust. Now let's talk about adding Rust code to an existing binary. In this case, Rust code will talk to your existing code through an in-process foreign function interface, or FFI for short. Let's say that your existing application is written mostly in C++. You should find an interface boundary in your application where it will be convenient for C++ to interact with Rust. What does this mean? API on this cross-language boundary should be compatible with Rust aliasing and borrow checking rules. I will talk more about this later. Another factor to consider is that bridging small and stable APIs to Rust is easier and cheaper to maintain compared to bridging broad and constantly changing APIs. So I said that foreign language API should follow Rust rules. What do I mean exactly? It is possible to bridge any foreign language API to unsafe Rust. However, that forces your team to sprinkle snippets of unsafe Rust throughout the code base. This is extremely not desirable. Unsafe Rust can be even more tricky to write than C++ because it has new kinds of undefined behavior compared to C++, for example, stack borrowed violations. Your actual goal should be bringing your foreign language API to safe Rust, and that requires your existing code, for example, your C++ code, to follow Rust safety rules at least on the API boundary. Let's look at an example. Imagine that one of the central data structures in your application is an in-memory cache. It is used everywhere, so to start writing meaningful logic in Rust, you need to make this cache available to Rust code. 
Here is the C API for the cache. There is a struct for the cache itself, a struct for the cache entry, and the function to find an entry by its key. You can bridge this simple API to unsafe Rust like this. C structs become Rust structs. A C function becomes an extra C function in Rust. Const pointers in C map to const pointers in Rust. And non-const pointers map to mute pointers in Rust. This is a very straightforward mapping. Here's how one can use this bridged API from Rust. Note the unsafe keyword, which is necessary to call an unsafe function and to the reference a pointer. Writing unsafe Rust code is tricky and error prone, so unsafe bindings are not a good choice. What we actually want is a safe find entry function. Its parameters and return value use Rust references instead of pointers. One thing to note is that pointers are nullable in Rust, but references are not. So from the documentation, we know that the argument, the cache, must be non-null, so it becomes a plain reference. However, the return value may be null, so it becomes an optional reference. We can call the find entry function without unsafe. This looks great, and we can start writing our application logic in Rust. The only issue is that when key one is equal to key two, we create two mutable references to the same cache entry. This is instant undefined behavior in Rust. Note that the equivalent C code would be perfectly fine and free of undefined behavior. Can we fix our safe Rust bindings to avoid triggering undefined behavior? Yes, we can. The fix is to change the find entry function to borrow the cache mutably. The code that triggers undefined behavior does not compile anymore because it tries to borrow mutably the cache twice. Problem solved. Or is it really? The equivalent code in C would have compiled just fine. We now have safe Rust bindings for the cache API, but they are less expressive than the original C API. If you only ever need to, come to operate on one cache entry at a time, reduced expressivity is not a problem. But what if you actually need to process two distinct cache entries at the same time? It is possible to allow that, but not with this cache entry API. We would need to write a small adapter API that finds two entries at the same time while checking that keys are distinct. But let's, but let's not get too much into the details of that. My point is, bridging other languages to safe Rust is tricky. It is very easy to bridge incorrectly, violate Rust aliasing and stack borrows rules, and invoke undefined behavior. But even once you have correctly implemented safe Rust bindings, you might find that you cannot translate your old code into Rust directly because it does not pass the borrow checker. Working around that typically requires redesigning or wrapping your foreign language API, and that might be more work than you anticipated. And now, handing it off to Marcel to talk about the build system. Thank you, Dimitri. Hello, everybody. My name is Marcel. I work at a software engineer at Google, and I work with Dimitri. As he said, you will need to evaluate your current development process and plan how Rust will fit in. Let's talk about your build system. There is a chance that your project uses a build system that does not support Rust. In that case, you will need to take care of that first, and there are two options. Your first option is to add a second build system to your project, for example, Cargo. This second build system will be responsible only for Rust code. Your current build system will then invoke the inner Rust build system as a build task. The second incremental way forward is to implement Rust support for your current build system. Finally, there is an option to migrate your large project to a different build system. However, this is a huge task and it will need to be done incrementally. The strategy for adopting Rust that Dimitri mentioned before works quite well there too. If you were starting a new Rust-only project, you would probably choose Cargo as the build system and it would be a nice, smooth experience. Cargo is the default build system and a package manager for Rust, and it's the one of the reasons why writing Rust feels so productive. There are other build systems that support Rust, for example, Bazel, Bug, Gradle, and some others. 
Besides building your production code, a build system is also typically responsible for building and running tests. You can of course run Rust and non-Rust tests as two separate tasks in your CI, but it will be inconvenient for engineers to run tests on their local workstation. It is better if your build system can run all tests with a single command. If you choose to adopt a second build system, your top-level build system can ask the inner build system to run Rust tests. Then the top-level build system parses and passes through the pass-fail results. The most integrated solution is to use the Rust build system to build Rust tests and to use the outer build system to run them. One important advantage of Rust is crates.io, a large collection of high-quality open source libraries. You don't want to miss out on those. They make the cost of adopting Rust lower by providing alternatives to libraries uh, that you may be using written in other languages. Unsurprisingly, Cargo nicely integrates with crates.io. Integrations with other build systems used to be a bit rough, but they are quite decent now and are getting better. If your build system doesn't support Rust, you will need to vendor the crates your, into your project repository and maintain build scripts for them. Don't forget to include this into your maintenance cost calculation. For some projects, it will make sense to develop automation that generates build scripts from cargo build files. If you decide to implement support for Rust in your existing build system, one of the first decisions you'll have to make is what kind of output you would request from the Rust compiler. Rust compiler officially supports three build artifacts. Bin is for executable binaries, and it is going to be your choice for out-of-process integration that Dimitri explained before. For in-process integration, you have two supported options and one unsupported. Each of them has its own advantages and limitations. Staticlib is a library artifact that bundles all the Rust code and its dependencies. A limitation of Staticlib is that you can only have one Staticlib in a binary. Therefore, it must contain all the Rust code that the binary links, and that might be inconvenient for the, from the architectural uh, or the build system point of view. CDILIP is a shared library equivalent of Staticlib. Like Staticlib, it must contain all the Rust code in a binary, and there can only be one. RLIPs are intermediate artifacts that the Rust compiler creates when compiling library crates. The format is not yet stabilized and can change in the future. The benefit of RLIPs is that they allow arbitrarily mixed Rust and other native libraries. In addition, the build scales better with RLIPs since each Rust crate is only compiled once and then linked into a binary without further transformations. With static and CDILIP, there is an additional bundling step before linking. There is a wrinkle though. The Rust compiler doesn't generate code for all the symbols used in these libraries. For example, code for certain memory allocator functions is generated by the Rust compiler only when producing binary, a static lib, or a CDILIP. This feature is used, for example, by crates that configure the memory allocator for all other dependencies of the binary. If you want to use RLIPs in your build graph, you have to explicitly provide definition for these functions. The link on the slide describes one fragile way to do it. Each time the Rust compiler changes some implementation detail, and of these functions, you have to update your workaround. Unsurprisingly, there are people working on stabilizing RLIPs and on demand generation of allocator functions. And with that, I give this back to Dimitri. Let's summarize. In a big project, big changes can be only done incrementally. You shouldn't rewrite in Rust just to adopt Rust. You need a much stronger justification. Think about technical, process, and social components of your Rust adoption strategy. Approach Rust adoption as an experiment. Start with a small team, gather data, hold the retrospective, and decide what to do based on your team's and leadership response. Do what is right for your team. It is easier to start using Rust by adding a new binary to the project. If you must use in-process integration, you should aim to provide safe bindings for your non-Rust code. Unfortunately, 
you might need to redesign some of your APIs to define safe bindings that preserve API expressivity. You need to budget extra time for that. That brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much for your time, and we hope this helps you adopt trust in your project. Thanks, Dimitri and Marcel. I really appreciated the depth of thought and care that goes into the ambitious, but also cautious adoption of Rust into a much larger code base. Okay, so next we'll hear from Wedson, who will be highlighting the work to use Rust in one of the largest open source projects in the world, Linux. Over to you, Wedson. Hi there, I'm Wedson. I'm a software engineer at Google and a maintainer of the Rust for Linux project. And today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about this project um, what we're doing, why we're doing this, how we're doing this. And along the way, I'm going to show you a few examples that showcase um, the interfaces that we built uh, for, for as part of this project. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, we faced uh, during, during this project. And I'm going to finish up with uh, our plans for the future. So let's get started. Uh, what, what, what is it that we're doing? Okay, uh, we're making Rust a first-class language uh, for Linux kernel development. And what I mean by that is we want Rust to be fully integrated into the build system, the testing tools, integration, and um, all infrastructure uh, related to, to the development of, of Linux kernel uh, modules. And the idea is that eventually we'll get to a state where, uh, when, where a developer can, can decide uh, which language they want to use. They can, they can pick C or they can pick Rust for, for, their, for their new projects. And then once, once we describe this to people, a natural question that follows is why would we want to do that given that C has been used successfully for, for over 50 years uh, to develop kernels. Um, and uh, as, as some background for that, the first thing we'd like to, 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 to discuss is, is, is the Linux kernel itself. Uh, it's, it's widely used, it's used uh, in embedded devices, in mobile devices, uh, laptops, uh, desktops, servers, uh, supercomputers. It's used in billions of devices. So it's widely used. Um, another aspect of this is that it runs in a more privileged mode than most applications, which makes it a prime target for, for attackers. And vulnerabilities in, in the Rust kernel uh, result in, usually result in, in high severity issues. Um, so in the in the in the slide, we actually have a, a the number of bugs found uh, each year over the, over the last uh, ten years, and if you look at uh, 2022, we already have 122 uh, vulnerabilities found this year, which means that even if we stop today uh, finding vulnerabilities, if we find we find no more vulnerabilities this year, uh, we still have um, uh, at least one vulnerability every three days uh, found found in the kernel. And uh, this is where we think Rust can improve the situation. Estimates uh, show that between 70 and 80% of these vulnerabilities are due to uh, memory safety issues. And, and Rust eliminates these, these classes of vulnerabilities by construction. Okay? So if one chooses to, to write new code in Rust, they'll know that um, these vulnerabilities will not exist in, in their code. Uh, and they can do that without affecting performance. And um, since Rust has a richer uh, type system and is a more modern language, uh, it allows other classes of bugs to be uh, found at compile time too. So it improves productivity. And we'll see a few examples of that in, uh, in, in the following slides. But before we go into that, um, we'd, we'd like to, we'd, we'd like to, to, to discuss um, uh, how, how we're doing this, okay? The first thing, that, and, and, and the strategy for doing this is this. Uh, we integrate with, with the build system, meaning that we allow people to, to write uh, Rust source code and that gets compiled and linked into, into the system. Um, and we use BindGen to go through the C header files uh, from, from, from the C side of, of, of the kernel and generate uh, Rust versions of those. And lastly, since we don't want people to call those functions directly because uh, those calls would be unsafe, we implement safe abstractions uh, for, for these uh, C functions around subsystems. Uh, and that's what we want uh, developers to, to build on. And our expectation is that uh, we'll have very little, if, if, if any, uh, unsafe calls when developing um, Rust, uh, Rust code in the, in the kernel. Um, so let's go into a couple of examples that will um, give you an idea of, of what these interfaces look like. 
the first example is, is interrupt handlers. Um, in, in Rust, um, uh, this is, this is how, how one would, would implement uh, an interrupt handler. Uh, the top part is the handler itself. The bottom part is uh, how, how we register with the, with the interrupt subsystem that we are interested in handling some, some interrupt. Um, and as you can see highlighted there, uh, one thing that you have to do is you have to specify the type of data that is attached to, to your handler, the context data that is attached to it. Um, and in C, for example, this, this is not done this way. In C, you have no way to uh, declare a type and then have functions have different arguments based on that type. You, you have to cast, usually use void star arguments and you cast them. And this is, of course, unsafe because uh, code can, can get out of sync and can result in, in memory issues there. Uh, in Rust, we don't have that. We declare the types. And the type declared in, in, in the handler dictates what the type is that um, gets called in the, in the handler function and what, what uh, type of data you need to pass when you register. And you can see that in the bottom of the slide uh, highlighted data. The type of data there is ref and VMEQ, which in this case is, is a ref counted uh, data structure. Um, another aspect of this that is, we feel is an improvement over C in terms of productivity is that um, the registration uh, has a destructor or a drop implementation that automatically unregisters when it goes out of scope. Um, and, and related to memory safety here, data uh, in this case here uh, is actually becomes owned by the, by, by the handler, which means that it's guaranteed to be, to be alive while the handlers are, are, are being called. And when, when uh, the registration um, uh, is, is, is being destructed, we first unregister and ensure that no more handlers are running, uh, so the data is not being used. Then we destruct the data, which in ref counted uh, case means that we we just decrement ref count and free it if, it's, if it goes to zero. And if it's just a regular pointer, it, it gets freed, uh, uh, just freed automatically. So this is the first example. The second example has to do with uh, reference counting of C data structures. Um, in the kernel, we have, we have lots and lots of data structures that are ref counted. And here in this, in this slide, we have uh, a few of them. And um, in, in, in the first column, we have the name of the struct. And in the second column, we have the function that is used to increment the ref count. And on the, second, on the third column, we have the function that is used to decrement uh, the ref count. In, in, in addition to using finding out what these functions are to increment and decrement, um, developers also have to follow a discipline uh, for example, uh, when they're done using the pointer, uh, if they own an incremented ref count, they, they need to ensure that they decrement the ref count so we don't have leaks. Um, and when they're holding on to pointers that, that's, that they are passed to them, they need to increment uh, the ref count. Otherwise, they may end up with um, um, uh, dangling pointers. Um, and, and they get no help from the compiler in doing this uh, on the C side. But as, as we'll see in the, in the following slides, uh, Rust helps us with that. So here's, here's an example of, of using reference counted uh, files in this case. We have a create function that just creates some file and returns a, a, a pointer to the, to the file that, is, uh, that, that owns an increment in the ref count of file. And then the takeover function actually takes one of these uh, pointers as, as argument. And the idea here is that uh, it's called takeover because it takes over that increment on, of the ref count, which means that it is itself responsible for uh, decrementing the ref count. And you can see here that in Rust, uh, in this example, it's just um, an empty function. However, the drop implementation of, of a ref, which is the destructor, um, automatically decrements ref count for us. So this is one source of mistakes that would lead to uh, memory leaks that uh, Rust helps us with. Um, in, the, in the example one function, we see takeover being called. But the argument that, that uh, example one uh, takes f is just a shared reference to a file. So it doesn't own the, the increment of a ref count in, in file. So we cannot here call just takeover f because uh, takeover expects a owned increment of the ref count. Uh, so we call this method called into that converts a shared reference file to an owned uh, reference to, to, to file. And which means that takeover can then decrement the ref count when, when, when it chooses. Uh, so this is uh, another way that uh, Rust uh, uh, helps us here. If we, if, we call, if we call a function that expects to, to take over the, the, the reference and we don't actually pass it a own, an owned uh, reference, it, it won't compile. 
Um, and in example two here, we have another example of call and takeover. Uh, but here, instead of calling into, we call clone. And the reason we call clone here is because we already have an owned reference. So what clone does is it increments the ref count and then uh, takeover gets, gets called. Uh, so it's similar to, to, to the previous one, but we use a different method to, because we have a different uh, object uh, type to convert. Now, since f is, is the return value of create, it's already itself an owned reference. So we could have just called takeover with f. But uh, if we had done that, then we wouldn't be able to use f afterwards because we would be handing over the, the reference that we owned to take, take over. Uh, and if we were to do that, the compiler would catch it and not allow us to compile this code. It would complain that uh, f, um, uh, ownership of f, f was transferred to take over, so we shouldn't be able to, to, to use it. Uh, so this is another way in which uh, Rust helps us here with safety. Right? If we make this mistake of transferring ownership of, of, of something to, to a function, then we're not allowed to use it afterwards. And if we try to do it, then compilation fails. Um, and lastly, about uh, these file examples, we have this ampersand f, which, which converts a owned reference into a shared reference. And this is how we call example one. If we try to call example one by just passing f, it wouldn't compile because the, the types are different. Now, this is it for, for using uh, files, uh, ref counted files in, in Rust. Now here we have, uh, we have the same code, but instead of having files, we have tasks, right? So what, what we want to show here is that um, the way we do ref counting of C data structures in Rust is consistent for all data types uh, that are ref counted. Um, so, so all the code that we had before for, for file uh, is also usable here for, for tasks. So what, what does this uh, sort of uh, abstraction uh, offers us, right? Um, um, and this ties us back to, to, to our discussion before of why we're doing this. The first thing that gives us is safety, right? So if we stick to the safe uh, dialect of the language, which is what we did in the previous slides, then we're guaranteed to have no dangling pointers, no use after free issues, which amount to 70 to 80% of the vulnerabilities that we find in the kernel and, and other C-like uh, projects. Uh, it also improves productivity because we have a consistent way to handle ref counting of these objects. We don't have to try to first find out whether an object is, is, is ref counted and how to increment, how to decrement the ref count. Those are all um, consistent across all types. Um, and this also improves uh, productivity because um, we don't have to remember that we always need to decrement the ref count. And uh, we know that if we pass ownership from one function to another, um, then uh, we know that the compiler will prevent us from, from using the object again. And lastly, uh, the performance aspect of this. Uh, what, what is important here is that, important to realize here is that uh, these abstraction is actually zero cost. So um, uh, all, all of this uh, abstraction is actually compiled out of the way and, and turned into C calls. Um, by, by, by the compiler. Uh, and in fact, when, when LTO is enabled, this may even be in lined. So they, they're not even C functions, C function calls. They are just um, instructions in the instruction stream for, for, for those functions. And, and, and this is what I, what I had to, to, to tell you in terms of um, examples for, for Rust in the kernel. Now let's talk a little bit about the challenges that we faced uh, while working on, on, on this project. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you about some of the technical ones. And the first one is self-referential data structures. In the kernel, we have lots of them. For example, uh, list heads. Uh, they are circular doubly linked lists, uh, which means that uh, they have pointers to, to themselves. The entries have pointers to themselves, either di directly or indirectly. But those uh, pointers are there. Um, and this is actually uh, something that is very common in the, in the, in the kernel and used to build a lot of other um, primitives. Now, the difficulty for us with Rust is that Rust expects um, all, all data structures uh, to be movable. And by movable, I mean that um, we can copy uh, the contents of these data structures uh, bit by bit from one location to another. And in most cases, this works fine. But when we have self-references, um, then we end up with dangling pointers uh, pointing to, to data that was, was, was moved. And this is exactly the sort of thing that, that we want to prevent. So we can't allow this when we're dealing with, with uh, C structs. And the way to, to avoid that in, on, on the Rust side is to, is to use pinning. Uh, and pinning comes with lots of challenges in terms of ergonomics. 
So um, at the moment, we require additional unsafe blocks when we're initializing mutexes, for example. But the good news here is that uh, we actually think we found a way to, to avoid this and uh, not require uh, changes, to, changes to the language. Uh, so we're working uh, in, in a solution for that. Uh, the next uh, big challenge we had was that um, BindGen doesn't handle uh, non-trivial macros and inline functions. And we have lots of those uh, in the kernel, mostly for, for performance. Uh, before we had we had LTO, lots of functions were declared in, in header files as inline functions, uh, such that they would be inlined if the, on the C side if the compiler uh, decided uh, to do that. And, and BindGen doesn't handle those functions, uh, which means that every time we want to use one of those, we have to write uh, manual uh, bindings uh, ourselves, which gets in the way. Uh, and but 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 it's it, it's it's. It's not show-stopping, but, but it's, it's, it gets in, a little bit in the way. Uh, and the last thing that uh, we'd like to, to point out as, as technical issues is unstable features. We actually use uh, several unstable features of the compiler uh, at the moment. For example, uh, we have a different implementation of ARC, which we call RAF, uh, because we want different behavior in, in RAF counting. Um, uh, the kernel itself has an implementation, and we want to use that implementation instead of the, the rest one due to different behaviors. Um, and we have a few other places where we need um, these unstable features. And the problem with needing these unstable features is that we cannot just uh, declare a minimal um, um, compiler version and, and allow people to just use any compiler starting from that. Um, we actually have to, to mostly stay with, with the latest and greatest uh, stable version of, of, of the compiler. Uh, over time, we want to, to move away from these unstable features, either by stabilizing them or finding different ways of, of, of doing things. Um, and then once, once we reach this state where we have no unstable features, then we can do this thing where we uh, declare what, the, what the, the minimal version is and just um, use that. And then people will be able to use uh, the, the compiler version that is shipped with their distributions, for example. In terms of uh, not as technical uh, challenges um, that we've faced, uh, the first one is that some developers are still skeptical about uh, Rust in the kernel, right? They either don't see Rust as an improvement or they think the risks of, of adding Rust uh, outweigh the benefits. And um, so we're trying to, to have uh, uh, discussions with, 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 with uh, these uh, developers and we're trying to, to get to the core of the issues. Um, but another thing that we're running into is, is, is bike shedding. Uh, while, while having these discussions, um, a lot of the discussions actually um, end up being discussions about the, the coding style. Should we mimic the, the Rust, uh, the, the Rust uh, style or should we use the Linux kernel C style? Something similar to that. And um, some developers find that the syntax of the language is, is unreadable and things like those. So the, the, the discussion sort of like lose focus uh, because of these, these issues that are not all that important and don't come to the core of, of, of uh, the benefits that Rust brings and the risks. So we're, we're finding uh, uh, some difficulties in, in, in getting through to, to, to those things and something we need to, to work on. Um, but the, the last uh, aspect uh, that, that I flagged as not as technical is the lack of support for, for all architecture. Uh, the kernel actually supports uh, lots of architectures, but um, LLVM doesn't support all of them. So um, I, I, I claim that this is not as technical, uh, despite having lots of technical aspects to this, because uh, we actually have uh, several fronts in which we are addressing this. Uh, well, other, other people are, are helping us address this issue. One, one of, of them is, is a front end, a GCC front end for Rust. Um, and this has actually been approved by the GCC steering committee. And what that gives us is uh, once it's ready, it will give us the ability to, to, to use GCC, which actually supports all the architectures that um, the kernel supports. So this, this would go away once that project um, is finished. Um, we also feel that uh, once this is uh, upstreamed, this effort is upstreamed, then the, the owners of these architectures will actually be encouraged and will have an incentive to go work with the LLVM community to, to add support to the LLVM uh, backends, such that the architectures will be uh, automatically supported in the in, in, in kernels compiled with, with Rust support. So the last thing I'd like to tell you about uh, today is, is what it is that we're doing next, okay? 
So uh, the first thing is upstreaming uh, this, this REST support that we've been uh, working on. At the moment, we have uh, a clone of, of, of mainline, and we add our patches to that clone. It's available on GitHub for anyone to uh, clone and, and contribute and, and look at it if, if they so choose. Um, and we, of course, keep this up to date with mainline. Every time there's a new release, we rebase on top of that version. Uh, and what we want eventually is for this to be upstreamed into mainline kernel, which will uh, mean that uh, anybody who wants to build uh, Rust code uh, can just get, get the support automatically by cloning any, any version of, of, of mainline kernel and kernels that are derived from that, which is basically most 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 kernels. Um, so this is this is the, the, the primary thing that we're working on. The next thing is working with with maintainers, and the idea here is that we want uh, uh, um, maintainers are obviously better positioned uh, to 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 write these abstractions because they've written the C version and they understand all the issues and they know the kinds of mistakes that people make while using the, the their subsystems. So uh, we want to work with them, and uh, what we can bring is some of this experience that we've had in building these other abstractions. So we know the ways in which we can leverage the Rust type system to um, catch mistakes earlier. And uh, so, so this, is, this is something that, that we're looking to do. Uh, and even for subsystems that uh, already uh, have uh, um, so, some of these abstractions, uh, we still want to, to work with maintainers to make sure that we cover all the scenarios and uh, we, we, we get the feedback from them on, on what, what could be improved. And, and lastly, we also want to work with all the, the developers that want to use these abstractions that, that we, are, we are building. And the idea is that we fully expect uh, uh, for there to be some rough edges in these uh, abstractions, because when we build them, we build them with a specific scenario in mind. And uh, when people try to use this for different scenarios, uh, they may run into issues. So we want to hear about those, and we want to help people uh, address those 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 issues, and of course, we want to use this feedback to then um, uh, update our our abstractions and and improve them, such that uh, 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 the experience will be better for for developers coming afterwards. Um, and and lastly, we we also understand that um, uh, despite having some samples, we, we we don't really have a lot of um, uh, resources that people can use to learn how to, to write this code. So uh, our plan is also to work on producing some material uh, for for developers to 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 be able to learn how to, to write this code and, and get up to speed quickly. That was all I had. Uh, thank you for watching and have a great day. Thanks, Watson. I've been watching Rust Journey in Linux with interest and can't wait to see where it goes next. So far, we've heard a lot about how Rust can be integrated into your code base, but once you have Rust in your code base, you have to make sure it keeps working smoothly. Next up, Sharish Chu and Chris Wales will be discussing maintaining a Rust toolchain for a large project such as Android. Take it away, Sharish and Chris. Hi, I'm Sharish Chu. I work on the Rust toolchain alongside Chris Wales on Android. The focus of our team is to keep the Rust toolchain up to date with upstream Rust, providing Android developers with a reliable code base and compiler. In our talk today, we'll discuss why keeping an up to date toolchain is useful, how we do it, how we focus on speed, and the many things that can go wrong along the way. Lucky for us, Rust is a language that is constantly evolving and getting better. There is a rich community of developers designing, proposing, experimenting, and testing out new ideas all the time. Uh, these new ideas turn into proposals, language initiatives that are discussed on various platforms and iterated over. These new ideas just constantly push the language forward, in making improvement after improvement. Sometimes these new ideas are beta tested on Rust's nightly build and then move to the stable branch when they're ready. The Rust community officially releases a stable version of language every six weeks, sometimes more often when there are incremental point releases. With each release version of the language, you might have improvements targeting, targeting usability, security, performance, among many other things. Uh, these improvements are coupled with changes to the compiler, documentation, uh, which could be small in scope, but still impactful and wide-reaching. 
in order to run your prior Rust code with a newer version of the compiler, you might need to make some changes to your code. You might need to make small syntactical changes throughout your code base, which can be very straightforward and you have Clippy to help you. Or you might have to rethink a part of your implementation because there are new APIs or, or because you just want to take advantage of the optimizations and features that are now available for your language. Keeping your code base up to date with each release of the language can be a lot of work. When you don't keep up regularly, your code base could easily just lag behind uh, the top of tree, resulting in big changes when you do actually update your code. And this unfortunately allows developers to miss out on all the positive improvements of the language that are being done, some of which could make changes to your system that become more robust and high performant, as well as fixes to bugs. On Google Android, we want our developers to be able to use the latest features of the Rust language as soon as possible. So our team focuses on doing the work of maintaining a stable, up-to-date tool chain and other developers can then use that to compile their Rust code. So our team manages the synchronization between Android code base, Rint and Rust, and several target architectures so that we can keep up with the Rust language. Every release, our team grabs the upstream version of the Rust compiler and tries to build our system with it. Our goal is to evolve the Android platform to use these new API and features. During this time, we perform several types of code modifications and fixes. We have to copy some shared libraries like libc++ and libc-muscle, for instance. Um, we, we copy those shared libraries into the pre-built to ensure they're being used at runtime. In addition, we copy a subset of standard library source files. Uh, when we have a version of the compiler that is compatible with the Android code base, we upload those pre-built so that other developers can then use it seamlessly. Um, we do tests as we go, and then we address any breakages and general challenges as they arise. In this process, we are doing a lot of coordination between moving pieces. We are creating a single compiler to be used for a full set of Google projects on Android. So we coordinate with different developers from different projects. We make suggestions to their code to keep it up to date with the latest release of Rust. Um, and we communicate with them on the best way to move forward. We depend on a large set of libraries and crates. We also have a number of compiler flags for different target architectures. As you can imagine, synchronization between these different libraries and compiler flags for the different target architectures can be difficult to manage. At the end of this talk, we're gonna dive deeper into these issues and errors that can come up and the many things that can go wrong along the way. Uh, for now, I'll pass this over to Chris Wales, who will describe how we build a tool chain and how to make it fast. Thank you, Sharice. In the next two sections, I'm going to talk about the mechanisms that we use to configure a Rust toolchain build and some of the optimizations that we've implemented using those mechanisms. Building Android platform code is complicated. We need to ensure the specific libraries are used and flags are set. As such, we have opinions about how the Rust toolchain should be built. And so we did what programmers do best. We added another layer of abstraction by adding a third build system to the bootstrap process. In addition to enabling us to build the toolchain for Android in the first place, this new build layer also allows us to enable or disable features from the command line without having to edit files. This is important as it helps us test different configurations much more rapidly than we'd be able to otherwise. So how does our new turtle interact with the other turtles? Through three main mechanisms wrapper scripts, the top-level config.toml file, and environment variables. In the next several slides, I'll discuss each of these in detail. First up are the wrapper scripts. These scripts are shell files that contain compiler, sysroot, and include paths, as well as additional arguments. Why do we need these wrapper scripts? Firstly, the Rust bootstrap system will pass the wrappers to each of the various stages of the compilation process, including LLVM and create build scripts. By reusing the wrapper scripts, we ensure that the pro proper arguments are being used at all times. Secondly, by using the wrapper scripts, we generate a record of the compiler configuration that is persisted after the bootstrap process is complete. This aids in debugging and validating the build. Next up is the top-level config.toml file. In Android, this file is almost entirely generated and currently comes out to around 110 lines of configuration. 
There are many options that can be set in the config.toml file, including LLVM specific flags and paths to wrapper scripts and executables. We also make use of several undocumented features, such as options for specifying PGO profile locations. It is important to note that some of the options have unexpected or tricky interactions. Looking at the code snippet, you can see that we wish to use libc++. However, to avoid linker errors, we also have to specify that we don't want to statically link in libstudc++, a library we didn't want to link in the first place. Luckily, behavior like this is rare, and most of the configuration options are straightforward in their use. Lastly, there are environment variables. Sometimes the configuration we wish to specify can't be put into the wrapper script or config.toml file directly. For example, some LTO-related flags break CMake's compiler detection. And because Rust doesn't pass the linker wrapper to LLVM's build system, some target-specific linker flags must also be passed in the environment. We also need to set variables like LD library path to ensure that intermediate binaries are able to locate shared libraries while we're bootstrapping the compiler. And sometimes we find we need to pass additional flags to the Rust compiler via Rust flags. So what do we do with all of this unlimited configuration power? Broadly speaking, our configuration choices fall into either the correctness or performance category. To ensure that the builds are hermetic, we specify paths to headers and libraries. We define macros and specify symbols that are otherwise absent in leak time. And we set the standard library and runtimes uh, that should be used. To make the compiler faster, we enable link time garbage collection, link time optimization, profile guided optimization, both regular and context sensitive, and post link optimization using Bolt. In the next several slides, I'll go over the optimizations I just mentioned and review their impact. When discussing software performance, one of the first things you must decide is what configuration you're going to use as a baseline. For Android, we've settled on using a toolchain with static LLVM linkage and link time garbage collection as our baseline. This configuration produces a 2% size savings and a 1% performance degradation compared to building Rust with default options. A 2% size decrease isn't game changing, but GC sections helps prevent further size increases due to some other optimizations. The 1% speed decrease is within measurement noise, and we, as such, we consider this to be an acceptable trade-off. Now that we know what we're going to be comparing against, let's look at the impact of LTO on the Rust toolchain. We perform link time optimization on both the LLVM libraries and the Rust code. This works most of the time, but on occasion, the version of intermediate representation used by our Clang and the entry LLVM differ. When this occurs, we need to disable LTO for the toolchain until the two versions of LLVM are resynchronized. Workarounds are also required for a couple of edge cases. For example, when performing LTO for the ARM v7 Android target, there are several symbols that are present but unknown during link time. As such, we have to tell the linker that they exist ahead of time. Performing LTO on the Rust toolchain results in a minuscule increase in size while providing a 5% speed up in performance. Next up is profile guided optimization. For the Android toolchain, we perform both regular PGO as well as context sensitive PGO. The CS PGO is limited to only the LLVM libraries. Performing PGO requires a five stage pipeline where we repeatedly compile Android's Rust code to generate profiles and then re optimize the compiler. I'll go over this pipeline in more detail in the next slide. One of the difficulties in setting up PGO is ensuring that profile data is collected and named appropriately. Of particular note, the naming of profiles depends on the way LLVM is linked into the toolchain, whether it's static or dynamic. Performing PGO on the Rust toolchain produces a negligible decrease in size while providing a 2% increase in performance. This is a smaller performance gain than we were expecting, and we're investigating the issue further. Now, let's take a deeper look at the PGO pipeline steps. Android's PGO pipeline starts by instrumenting the Rust compiler so that it can be used to collect profile data. Next, we use this compiler to build all of Android's Rust targets. When this is done, the profile data is used to build a PGO Rust toolchain that is additionally instrumented to collect context-sensitive profile data. The Android codebase is then recompiled, and the PGO and CSPGO profiles are combined and used to generate the final version of the compiler. While this pipeline is usually executed on build and testing infrastructure inside Android, it is also possible to run the pipeline locally. This allows us to test changes rapidly, as well as allowing non-Googler developers to learn from and reproduce our builds. Lastly, we will discuss post-link optimization using Bolt, a tool that has recently been added to the LLVM ecosystem. Bolt performs two types of optimizations, profile independent and profile dependent. Some examples of profile independent optimizations include jump threading, macro op fusion, 
and instruction shortening. Profile-dependent optimizations include section reordering and hot code localization. Unfortunately, we are currently unable to perform bolt profiling on the Rust toolchain due to memory limitations. We're actively exploring how to resolve the issue and hope to enable profile-dependent optimizations in the future. As the profile-independent optimizations only yield a 1% increase in speed at the cost of a 20% size increase, we've decided not to enable Bolt for our production builds at this time. So, put together, what do all of these optimizations add up to? With all of the optimizations we've talked about enabled, we observe an 8% increase in performance. This is respectable, but we hope to push it further by improving our PGO implementation and getting Bolt profiling working. And with that, I'll pass things back to Sharice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Um, in this section, we we'll point out some issues we've encountered when updating the Rust toolchain for Android. A big part of our role is to just keep up with the language and the set of libraries that are constantly evolving. As things evolve, code changes. Previous patches that were successfully applied to the code base can easily become out of date with the latest release of the languages. That could be because the bugs were fixed and the patches were accepted upstream so they no longer need to be applied. Or it could be because something totally irrelevant happened and the changes were orthogonal to our patch, so we just need to update our patch to reflect the new changes to the code base. Um, over time, the system could also just expand and mature. New code might be necessary. Um, so we might need to import a new crate and take a look at its dependencies. Supporting their dependencies could include importing more crates or updating the versions that we're using on other existing crates and just keeping everything up to sync. During development, code could also just get moved. Um, for instance, a directory structure change could mean we are no longer pointing to the right path. Part of our job is just focused on all this configuration. We want to make sure that everything is pointing in the right direction. There are no mixed signals. We are using the exact right libraries and compilers during the build process. A hermeticity breakage occurs when the build uses a tool or header that is different from what we expected. For instance, a crate using a build script causing a different compiler or library to be used than expected. Some of these issues arise because of the bugs in the upstream build system. Others can be caused because the environment that are built in have certain defaults and carry unintended expectations. In order to fix these bugs, we just have to be more careful in how we direct traffic. That is to be very specific in the build process when to use certain libraries and executables. We want anyone to be able to reliably reproduce any build. So we're motivated to constantly continue maturing and developing our build system to address these types of issues. Another thing I want to highlight in this presentation is that we're not entirely alone when debugging Rust code. The slide has two examples. The first one in the blue box is a message from Clippy we get when trying to compile Android code with the latest release of the Rust compiler. Clippy provided some straightforward comments. It says we can't apply this urinary operator to a private field. After some digging, we can see that this error makes sense. This used to be a variable, but now it's a function. So it makes sense why the unary operator, which was uh, feasible to be applied before, can no longer be applied. And we can fix this just by finding the right access method. And the second example we show at the bottom of the slide um, shows a flag being deprecated and how we adjust to accommodate that. Uh, this is to show that while some breaks can feel confusing, there is also help. Generally, when things break, it can be very useful to reach out to the open source Rust community. When we find issues, we look for our open GitHub tickets. And if there isn't already an open issue, we open tickets and we create a local patch. Chris is working to upstream as many of our local patches as possible. These will help improve the Rust bootstrap process as well as modernize and improve Android support in Rust. I've had the fortunate experience where I've got to work on stabilizing language feature. That work included some changes to the compiler, as well as documentation and interacting with the community. As a result, I got to be a very minor contributor to a prior Rust release, uh, which is exciting for me because I love working on programming languages. Our team is looking for more ways to contribute to the Rust language. We're both very excited about Rust and its future. We hope to ultimately get to spend more time contributing to open source, so we will see you all out there.
Thank you so much for attending our talk today. I hope you had fun learning about keeping an up-to-date tool chain from our experience at Android. We really appreciate getting to be part of Open Source Day at Google and hope you enjoyed listening. Uh, this was keeping your Rust tool chain and dependencies up to date and running fast. Thanks, Sharice and Chris. I really like learning about setting up profile guided optimization. Lastly, we'll hear from Felipe de Albuquerque Melo Pereira, who will be sharing about his experiences porting a C library to Rust. Take it away, Felipe. Hi, everyone. I'm Felipe, and today I'm going to talk to you about a 20% project that I worked on last year, namely to port a C library to Rust. First, let me give you an overview of the project. The main objectives were to evaluate the feasibility of porting C code to Rust, in particular, annotating it with lifetimes and enforcing the exclusivity rule, to see how idiomatic the ported code would be, especially how much in safe code it would be needed. Uh, and we also wanted to investigate the ergonomics and the learning curve, the engineering productivity, and measure the runtime performance overhead of using Rust. The library I've ported is called WAF2. It's a C++ library used to convert font files from TTF in similar formats into the WAF2 file format and vice versa. Even though it was written in C++, its usage, its usage of classes is very similar to C scripts with very few methods and no special constructors or destructors. It also uses int for most integer values, except when directly writing to or reading from a file. And the reason why I'm pointing this out here is that this caused quite a bit of extra work during the port, as I'll go into details later on. The library depends on AppSeo and Brutley, which is a C library used to compress and decompress data. And one of the reasons why this library was chosen is that it contains about 6,700 lines of code, which should be possible for a single person to port. And this included a few unit tests, a few fuzzers, and multiple end-to-end -end tests over a big corpus of fun files. The existing unit tests only cover the main data structures, which are shared between WAF2 and WAF1. And unfortunately, there were no unit tests for the WAF2 specific logic. The end result of the port to Rust contains about 6,200 lines of code, including unit tests and twin tests and fuzzers. It depends on the Brutley library for compression and decompression, and also depends on the log crate, which I use as a convenient replacement for printing to SCDR. Uh, and here I could have done logging using just the standard library printing functions, but the log crate was a bit more convenient and made the intent clear. Lastly, as I mentioned, the C++ code uses AppSeo flags, but since there is no direct equivalent for AppSeo and REST, I use the arg crate developed by the Fushi team. For a bit of context, let's also talk about my experience with Rust and C++ before starting this project. I was an advanced beginner in Rust, having written a bit less than 10,000 lines of code, which included a few small pet projects, a university project, and some open source contributions. It might be important to note that I had no experience with larger Rust code bases, where complex data structure lifetimes are involved, nor was I experienced with newer Rust constructs like PIN. Had a bit more experience with C++, but it was not very deep either. I had used it in a few university classes, some small personal projects, and programming competitions, and a bit during an internship at Google. In total, I have probably written less than 100,000 lines of code in C++, but I did have much more experience reading large C++ code bases, both at Google and in open source projects. Based on this experience, I was confident that I could port most C++ code to Rust possibly after some fighting with the borrow checker. Of course, I did not expect my code to be the cleanest version possible, although I always tried writing the best possible code. Now let me show you how I approached the migration itself. I ported the WAF2 library from C++ to Rust in two passes. The first pass was as literal and mechanical a translation as reasonably possible, with very few exceptions that I'll mention in the next line. That took me 12 days of work. And in the second pass, I refactored the code to be more idiomatic Rust, which took me about eight days of work for a grand total of 20 days. In the first pass, I migrated one file at a time together with any existing unit tests, but often there were none. I then migrated end-to-end -end tests and fuzz tests at the end of the first pass. Since there was no C++ Rust interrupt, I only ran end-to-end -end tests after I finished the first pass. 
And as I've just mentioned, in the first pass, I intended to do a literal translation, but I deviated from a purely mechanical translation in a few ways. In the rest code, I've used options where it made sense. I used lices instead of pointer and length pairs, which did introduce a few bugs that I'll mention later. I use references instead of raw pointers. I use precisely sized integer types everywhere. I've also translated C++ integer coercion that truncate values into risk check conversions that trap on truncation, unless I recognize the code relied on truncation. I translated C++ unsigned integer arithmetic that wraps an overflow into regular arithmetic operators that trap an overflow in debug mode, unless I recognize the code relied on overflow. I also used FFI to call Brutley. And as already mentioned, I used the R crate as an imperfect replacement for app sale flags. Although I was careful, uh, these refactorings still introduce a few bugs only found by end-to-end -end tests. I will show you some of these bugs later in the presentation. Among the changes done during the second pass, I fixed bugs found by end-to-end -end tests at the end of the first pass. I removed all unsafe blocks with the exception of the FFI call to Brutley, which is inherently unsafe. I improved readability and made code more idiomatic, for instance, by refactoring all functions that use output params to use results instead and I applied most clippy suggestions. Let's look at an example here. As I've mentioned before, the WAF2 C++ code relies heavily on type coercions, since it uses int almost everywhere, except when reading from or writing to a font file. In the example here, we have a function called write triplet, which takes two ints, x and y, gets their absolute values, and then sorts each of them in a vector of bytes called glyph string. But in the highlighted code here, you can see that it implicitly assumes that both x and y fit in two bytes. Unfortunately, that is not obvious at all when you read the code that calculates x and y and calls the write triplet function. Therefore, refactoring this while porting the code to Rust took a lot of effort, since I had to consider what integer size was needed in each place and bubble up or down the call stack where needed. After doing all this, it was much more confident that the code worked as intended. It was not hiding hard to debug integer truncation bugs. So I believe the refactoring would have been e useful even in the C++ version of the code. Let's not now talk about the test coverage and the bugs I ran into. First, let's talk about tests. I only converted existing tests and did not write any new tests, with one exception. A simple unit test from the Brotley FFI, since the FFI glue code was new code that I added. The lack of unit tests made the migration much harder because the biggest and most complicated files, wav 2 enc and wav 2 dec for encode and decode, had no unit tests and took significantly longer to port. Just the wav 2 dec took me four full days of work. Also, these files had the most bugs introduced, which were only found and fixed after the first pass once the end-to-end -end tests were ported. Just to give an idea, the impact of the lack of unit tests uh, out of the 20 bugs they fixed in Rust code, 11 were bugs in those two files, wav 2 enc and wav 2 dec which had no unit tests. And three bugs were in other files that had unit tests, but in functions that were not covered by these tests. Which means 70% of the bugs introduced during the port were in code not covered by unit tests. And from the 20 bugs introduced during the port that were found by end to end tests and fuzzers, 14 of those bugs were caused by wrong mechanical conversions, for instance, I used wrong buffer sizes, I flipped Boolean conditions, or forgot else clauses. Uh, three bugs were caused by using different integer sizes, so truncation and overflow. Two bugs were borrow mute errors, which means the code violated runtime borrowing rules for ref cell. One bug was a panic found by fuzzer because the code was missing a check on the buffer size when reading from a file. And I also fixed one bug in unsafe code that I wrote during the first phase. When porting this code in the first pass, I thought a lot about why it was safe from a lifetime perspective, that is, no use of the free bug. But I forgot to think about whether it satisfied the rule of exclusivity, and it turns out it didn't. I found this bug when I was trying to convert the unsafe block to safe code, and the borrow checker was pointing out a mutable aliasing issue, which means the rule of exclusivity was broken. Even though it broke the borrow checker rules, it read from one field of an object and wrote to another field of the same object, so it might have been okay. And lastly, note that most of these bugs could have been caught with better unit test coverage. I believe this part of the presentation has many learnings. The first is that good unit tests help detect almost all classes of bugs, 
So test coverage is important. It might make sense to write more unit tests before starting the migration. The second learning is that the risk of human error when doing a mechanical translation is non-zero. Note here that I had three to four careful reviewers in every commit. Importantly, I believe these errors could be avoided if the synthetic transformation from C++ to Rust was done by a tool. This risk increases when doing non-trivial semantic changes during the migration, no matter how simple. One example is using slices instead of row pointers and length, which leads to the next learning. Port code using unsafe row pointer and length, then refactor to use slices. Or as an alternative, refactor the C++ code to use std span before migrating it to Rust. The fourth learning is that simple static analysis can detect some obvious borrow mute errors. Nonetheless, catching all borrow mute error before runtime is not always feasible, so it's important to have good test coverage when using RefSo. Lastly, it should come as no surprise, but having good knowledge of the problem domain helps to understand what's the correct and expected behavior. For example, whether the code relies on integer truncation or wrapping arithmetic overflow. Let's talk about the performance comparison between the C++ and Rust versions of the WAF2 code. First of all, I should mention that the WAF2 C++ code already included some benchmarks, which I ported to Rust. They measure both compression and decompression speed, and I ran them over a folder containing dozens, if not hundreds, of TTF files. I ran both the compression and decompression benchmarks using Google internal benchmarking tool, whose results we see here in this slide. The graph shows the average execution time and the 95 percentile confidence intervals, where C++ is the base. Rust was on average 0.3% faster in the decompressed benchmark, while it was 0.3% slower in the compressed one. But importantly, these differences were not statistically significant. But before you attach much meaning to them, I must say that once we looked at the flame graphs, we realized the difference in compression speed must be measurement noise because both implementations spent almost the entire execution time in Bratly rather in the code being ported. That was over 99.5% for compression and over 60% for decompression. I also measured peak memory usage of both implementations, and the results indicated no significant difference in memory consumption between them. So the conclusions we got from the benchmarks are that performance is comparable when using compilation mode opt in Bazel both in terms of speed and memory usage. Uh, it was not shown in these slides, but Rust is much faster in fast build and debug modes than C++ for the decompressed benchmark, 85% faster in fast build and 32% in debug mode. Uh, we currently don't know whether Rust has different effective optimizations enabled in LLVM for fast build and debug modes, which would explain the huge performance difference. And the last learning, which was also not shown here for lack of time, is that the overhead of unwrapping options and results eventually adds up. The same is true for checked casts. The way we realized this was that the code used to have unnecessary unwraps that, once removed, improved the Rust code performance, bringing it to parity with C++. I then created a commit for investigation purposes where I replaced all checked casts by blind casts. And this also caused some performance improvement. Let's talk about productivity and code quality in Rust. First of all, I do feel more productive in Rust than in C++. This feeling started after I understood more about ref cells and lifetimes, which happened after I struggled with them. Also, Rust has features that don't have equivalent in other languages I know. For example, the borrow checker, ref cells, pin, or lifetimes. Learning to think about them took a bit of time, but once they clicked, I was able to use them productively. In terms of designing data structures, Rust forces you to reason about things that C++ does not, like object lifetimes and simultaneous mutable and immutable borrows. I do believe that thinking about these things help to design data structures better and avoid surprising bugs. For example, whenever I fought the borrow checker, it was because it was, the code was doing weird things or the data structure was connected in unexpected ways. For example, some of them were self-referential and use the self-references for both writes and reads. When we talk about quality in terms of code re readability and confidence that it does what you would expect, I believe the quality of the Rust port is very similar to the original C++ implementation. But still, Rust is slightly better because it is explicit about integer type coercions and wrapping arithmetic overflows. It has lifetimes, which document invariants and help reason about how the data structures are connected. 
The code path is a borrow checker, which guarantees that use after free or accessing uninitialized pointers did not happen outside of unsafe blocks. Rust code is less verbose when doing simple operations like reading a file content into a buffer, reading from a buffer to an integer of a specific size, or dealing with NDNs. Rust also hides architecture-dependent logic away from the programmer. For example, it didn't require the use of compiler butins. And lastly, uh, writing print statements is much simpler since they don't change the pin and the type being printed. Nonetheless, Rust was more verbose in a few places, especially when some domain type was wrapped in option, box, refcel, pin, or rc. This means that not only the types are longer, but it also leads to verbosity in code that uses them, because we need to explicitly unwrap some of these types. We need to call borrow or borrow mute to get the value contained in a refcel. You also need to call unwrap to access the value inside an option that you know must be present. And C++ does not require any of this because it trusts the programmer blindly, avoiding these runtime checks. Finally, let's talk about the main learnings of this project. First learning was that doing the migration in two steps was a good strategy in general, but I would avoid any non-trivial changes in the first pass, like converting pointer and length pairs into slices. Even if Rust code does not look very idiomatic or it needs more unsafe blocks than it would be ideal. The second learning is that improving test coverage and refactoring code, for example, using studspan instead of pointer and length pairs, before migrating to Rust is very helpful. Improving the API can also be useful if possible. This decreases the number of bugs while porting and increases the migration speed. The third learning is that when using unsafe, one should justify why use after free does not happen and why the exclusivity rule is not broken. And reviewers should push back if it's not 100% clear why that is true. Also, having access to a group of Rust experts can help uh, come up with alternative solutions. The fourth learning is that there is a non-trivial risk of human error, even when doing a simple mechanical translation from C++ to Rust. Another learning is that there is no statistically significant performance difference between the C++ and Rust implementations of WAF2 in opt mode both in terms of memory usage and execution speed. And the last big learning, which I did not show in this presentation, is that Clippy was extremely helpful in improving code quality. So that's all I had for you today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you found this interesting. Thanks, Felipe. It was great to learn from you about how to do a file-by-file -file port of an existing code base while testing along the way. It seemed like a great approach to keep things working and limit the time spent with the code in an intermediate and broken state. So as a reminder, all the content from today will be available on demand after the event and published on the Google Open Source YouTube channel next week. The content will also be available with captions in English, Spanish, Chinese Mandarin, and Brazilian Portuguese. To access those captions, click on the settings icon located on the bottom right-hand side of the player and select subtitles slash CC. You can then scroll to select your desired language. Okay, so that's a wrap. You all know what it means. It's time to join us at the after party by clicking the watch live button on the events agenda page. Today's speakers will also be joining us for some Q&A and as well, we'll have an exciting quiz ready. We hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.